Hello, hello, happy Friday to you. It's so great to be here with you. Last day of the week. I hope you're looking forward to the weekend. I certainly am. As you know, we're live here and I'm excited to welcome you to today's live Level Up Conversation. Welcome to Level Up with Winnie Sun. Market Updates. Financial Pro. Get ready. I present to you Level Up with Winnie Sun. Hello, friends. I'm Winnie, your host, Forbes contributor, CNBC council member, and award winning financial pro here to keep you on top of all things relevant, trending business news and really things that hopefully inspire you to do your best and get out there and, you know, I don't know have positivity, happiness in your life and make the most of your life. But most importantly, you're part of today's show. So I want to say a big hello and welcome to, of course, Joshua Crossex Fighter on YouTube Live. I see you joining us. Thank you so much for being here with us. Vicky Garvey on Facebook Live. What a treat to have you as well. We are going live, as you know, on like, I think like, more than eight different social media platforms. So don't be shy. Let me know how your Friday is going. Of course, how your week's going and let me know where you're joining from. I would love to see your engagement because you're part of today's show, which makes it really, really fun. And today we actually have a very special guest. He's actually a very good friend of mine. I'm really, really excited to have him on. He's the author of The Poshmark Guide for Individuals and Small Businesses. And uh, he's the creator of The Pot. Poshmark Seller Journal for Individuals and Small Business and co-creator of the Corporate Circle, uh, actually, no, the co-creator of Corporate Clichés Coloring Book. He is an attorney, an entrepreneur, TEDx speaker, Poshmark ambassador, author, and let me just tell you, one of the nicest, greatest human beings you will meet. He's a, is a really, really great human. So you are in for a treat. He is certainly a friend of mine. I'm so excited to welcome him. But he's going to be here in just a moment because we're going to first start and tell you how the market closed. That's how we do it on the show, right? So the Dow closed down 403 points, and NASDAQ down 327 also, and the S&P 500 also down 86. So unfortunately, we're we're ending the week, my friends, on a very negative uh, beat here. Stocks really slumped today. In fact, I just had several client calls today, and they're going to be disappointed to see how today ended. Unfortunately, you know, investors are still very much concerned about inflation uh, levels. Of course, how the Fed's going to react next month with their interest rate. An increase and of course mortgage rates being an all-time high people are still looking whether they rent whether they buy what what kind of financial decisions they should make for their own life should they retire should they not those are all things that are putting pressure on today's market so we're seeing a lot of that trickle down triple down day unfortunately it is what it is but you know it couldn't be a friday without me sharing some fun stories for you right and this is one that i thought you might enjoy so i don't know do you have jeans at home because i certainly have jeans and you know being a mom of three kids let me tell you we seem to have a lot of a lot of jeans at home but ever thought like that your jeans might have more value than you believe them to be worth right you know i i've had as a a longtime friend a founder uh, of joe uh, not joe's jeans hudson jeans and peter kim one of the really, really profound artists, especially in the area of fashion. But here's a story that I thought was interesting. This is, of course, an article shared on CNN and a lot of other places, too. There was actually a pair of jeans, uh, 19th century Levi's jeans, in fact, that were recently sold, get this, for $87,000. That's right. So you're like thinking, maybe I have some old jeans in my closet and how much could they be worth? Well, if you have jeans that were around since the 1800s, they could be worth quite a bit. And it's interesting. I thought this was really interesting because in this story, you hear about how, you know, I don't know if it's a Gen Z or a millennial. He went and he bid and he made an offer and bought these jeans. And the historic value is pretty unprecedented. If you take a look at even the jeans themselves actually look like you could wear them today. Uh, they have 
certain some details that are unique to during that time period but you know they they're not that much different than some of the jeans that you wear today uh but certainly you know they had suspenders versus regular belt loops but just fascinating the history of how long levi's jeans have been i see that and i see cross sex fighters saying eighty seven thousand dollars for a pair of jeans yes in fact that's sort of the resale market right i guess they they call this like true vintage and I guess true vintage is worth quite a bit in the denim space and in, in fashion in general. And someone who knows quite a bit about that is my guest today. So I kind of hinted earlier who he would be, but you probably don't know his name. But if you're if you interact with me on Twitter, on our tweet chat, you actually might know. You might have even guessed. He is John Lim. So John, welcome to the show. How are you today, my friend? I'm doing great, Wendy. Thank you so much for having me and happy Friday to you. Happy Friday to you as well. And and actually on that, happy Friday to Robin Stevens. We're also seeing her join us on LinkedIn Live. Hi, Robin. So, so much for being here, Robin. It's so great to have you. So John is the host of the Moving Forward podcast. John, I know you just celebrated, what? 400, 200, episode 300, 400. 400 episodes. That's right. And you were, you were one of my featured special guests on that episode. Well, I, I'm thankful that I was able to, to to be part of that. I mean, anything that has John Lim attached to it, I feel honored to be a part of. So congratulations, 400 episodes. Thank you. Did it feel like as much work as it was? Yes and no. I, In some ways, it's gotten a lot easier since I started. But at the same time, it's continuing on and keeping that content consistent and uh you know keeping to a schedule so that's always a, that's always a challenge and then as with anything you know it, it takes it takes effort to run a marathon so but i'm having fun i that's the bottom line i i just i find the joy in it sharing the information connecting with an audience and so for me it's 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 a lot of work but it's also a lot of fun it's a lot of fun. I know we talked about this. It's just talk about the brain trust opportunity, too. I know you've had so many wonderful aha moments talking to your guests and learning about their experiences. And so I love to start there, John. I know you're an entrepreneur. You're an attorney. You're, you know, you're not only an entrepreneur, but an incredible speaker, podcast host as well. You know, I think a lot of people who meet you for the first time are sort of in awe. And I'd love to hear your backstory of how you got to where you are today. Can you take us back a bit? Sure. And uh, that's a very, very, very flattering way to put it. I like to say that I'm actually an expert in career wanderlust because, uh, you know, what I do now has very little resemblance to what I started out doing. So, you know, I, I, I've done so many different things and, and that was purely accidental, unintentional. I started out practicing law in the D.C. area. And, and so that was college, law school, uh, legal practice. I found that it wasn't, it wasn't quite the right fit for me. So I left the traditional practice of law. I worked in corporate America for uh, over a decade working for a, a legal research company and uh, really enjoyed that. I got to work with a lot of different clients. And that's really where I honed a lot of my presentation skills, was doing a lot of presentations, sales presentations, seminars, uh, and, and that was really valuable. I also took a bit of a sideways detour and I was an actor for a couple of years. So wow. it was a passion that I had, uh, you know, had a little bit of a seed for when I was in college taking uh, classes to prepare for law school. And then it was uh, during a retreat while I was working for this uh, legal publishing company that they brought in a, a drama professor from Harvard. And uh, when I gave up to give a demonstration, she actually encouraged me. She said, I recognize you have some acting training in you, so I, I encourage you to, to maybe get back into it. So I did that on the side for a couple of years and uh, actually appeared in a couple of television and film projects. And for those of you who are Star Trek fans, I, I actually played a, a young version of uh, George Takei's character from the original series in a mm -hmm. really beautifully produced independent film. Uh, called Star Trek World Enough in Time. And uh, and so that was a lot of fun. And um, I've done some consulting work. And as you've mentioned, you know, podcasting has been, been a big part of my life. And over the last couple of years, Poshmark, something I never would have imagined. I am not an expert in clothes. I, I'm mm -hmm. really not even an expert in sales per se. But uh, my dad, who's been a lifelong entrepreneur, he is you know, he's been immersed in that world for a long time. He has a small business. And so I've been working with him for the last four or five years, trying to help him get his small retail business online. 
And so that's how, uh, that's how I discovered Poshmark and fell into that journey. That's incredible. I mean, most people would not associate an attorney, entrepreneur, Poshmark, but you have it all in one little summary, which I love. I think we're going to get into that. I mean, John, we just talked about that pair of Levi's jeans that sold for over $87,000. Did you see the story? Did it surprise you? I, I just saw the story when you first mentioned it. Now that's amazing. I, I can't imagine <laughs> just what the story is behind that. And I'll, I'll, I'll probably look it up after uh, after the show, but that's incredible. But it, it's funny you mentioned that. Actually, a, a friend of mine who is a fellow Poshmark seller, uh, she came across uh, a Pokemon uh, card that her son had gotten through. You know, he's very much into Pokemon, and uh, it's an original. And I think the estimated appraised value is is either half a million or more. So you, you never know wow. what hidden treasures you might have in your closet. So uh, the jeans are just uh, another incredible example of that. Okay. So basically, <laughs> we now know that Pikachu could be worth a lot more than those pair of jeans. All right. This is incredible. You know, one thing that we certainly see through the years, John, is the importance of having that side hustle and yes. finding alternative ways, other ways, like extra ways of having income. And certainly places such as, you know, Poshmark and eBay through the years have been very good uh, avenues to to start small businesses or even just help clear your closet. I'm curious about how you discover Poshmark as an e-commerce platform for a small business. D like, how did this come about? Why not eBay? Why not somewhere else? That's a great question, Winnie. And in fact, that's where we originally started. So finding an e-commerce solution for a small business, actually, our first inclination was to try eBay. And this was this was around maybe 2008, nine. eBay at the time had a small business platform. It wasn't uh, as well known probably as it is now. And so we just tried it out. In fact, it was my dad's idea. He wasn't even looking to branch into e-commerce, but he had, he had you know learned about eBay and he thought it might be an interesting experiment. So we tried that, didn't really have much luck with it. It really wasn't until 2016 where my dad started to notice the trend of more and more customers who were coming in to browse, window shop, get fitted for sizing, and then going and buying whatever they were looking for online, whether it was Amazon or elsewhere. So my dad and I got into a big discussion about this. And I was actually in, I had just graduated you know, business school a couple of years before. And one of the case studies I'd read about was the 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 growth of independent sellers on Amazon through what's called FBA were fulfilled by Amazon. So I told him about this and he wasn't even aware that that was uh, something that existed. So we actually tried uh, setting up his business on Amazon FBA. Uh, you know, long story short, you know, it was a lot of hoops to jump through. It really wasn't easy to set up. And once we did get set up, even once we started generating sales, you know, Amazon has a very uh, buyer friendly policy of no questions return, you know, no questions asked for returns, which is great for a consumer, but for a small business, it can be really, really detrimental to their bottom line. So then we tried Shopify, you know, we tried all these different solutions and it was actually during a, a period in which I was ready to just give up because we'd had so many hurdles to jump through that I literally hopped onto Google, I think, and just typed in, where's a good place to sell closer? What's a good solution? And I think I came across a couple of articles, maybe from BuzzFeed or uh, somewhere else that was talking about Poshmark. And I wasn't familiar with Poshmark at the time. This was around 2018. And Poshmark, as you've so uh, you know accurately described, is originally designed for individuals who want to start a side hustle selling clothes out of their closet. That spare pair of jeans or that, you know, that sweater you're not wearing anymore. Uh, but I looked into it and a couple of things really appealed to me about it. Number one, it was a mobile centric platform and the other platforms that we had used were tried before. They were still mostly geared towards desktop. Maybe that's changed now, but in the mid 2000s and the early 2000s, e-commerce was really tethered to the desktop. Poshmark was one of the first uh, marketplaces that was really mostly app based. And that appealed to me because, you know, I don't always work with my dad and we're not always in the same location. So having something that was mobile was really attractive. 
One of the challenges we ran into with almost every platform, which you wouldn't think would be a challenge, and this is something that I wouldn't have known unless I really fell into this rabbit hole, is that doing things like size variations on one particular garment we're listing was a challenge on almost every single platform. So it, it either required some workaround solutions or some complex HTML coding, and Poshmark has a very simple interface. So they try to make it as easy as possible. You, literally, you can download the app, set up a store, set up your storefront, your virtual storefront, list your first item. You can do size variations. It's very, very, uh, it's very well designed from a user interface standpoint. So we downloaded it and decided to try it as an experiment. Now, in 2018, I don't think there were many businesses that were on Poshmark. It was still mostly geared towards individual sellers. So we were either the first or one of the first small businesses that actually decided to use it. And I, I will tell you, Winnie, I wish I could say that sales just reined in. But, it, you know, when we set up, it was May of 2018. We listed a couple of items and it was just crickets in the beginning. And it was crickets in the spring into the summer and into the fall. And by that time, it was such, such an exhausting amount of effort that we put into trying to crack the e-commerce code for a small business that we were almost ready to throw in the towel. But then I read some more articles and realized that there is actually a methodology. There's actually a, a very different aspect to Poshmark that differentiates itself from other platforms. It's, it's part social media based, so there's a lot of interactivity. So you've got to see it not as a list and leave it marketplace, but one that re does require some engagement. So once I started getting the hang of that and learning how to engage with the community and how to keep our listings refreshed, you know, by sharing, attending things like what are called Poshmark parties, which are just virtual hours set aside for sellers and buyers to congregate. That's when we started generating not only followers, but traction. And then we closed our first sale in October. And by the end of that uh, first year, we hit uh, our five figure sales mark. So, and we've been going strong ever since. So, and by the time the pandemic hit in 2020, my dad was already well prepared to shift more towards e-commerce. So it, it really ended up being a lifeline during the 2020 into 2021 period. Yeah, and that's a, that's an interesting thing, and I find this story so fascinating because you're talking about, I mean, your dad. You know, a lot of kids don't want to work with their parents, so I'm sure he's very happy that you're part of his life. But talk about that. I mean, talk about the relationship with your dad. Probably, um, you know, obviously different generation than you. Um, this embra embracing of new technology. Um, did he ever think that he would go e-commerce or? Like, how did this kind of come into fruition that the two of you decided to go into business together? You know, it's, it, what's amazing about my dad is that he is aware of everything that's going on. Like, he knows what TikTok is. He he, he was the <laughs> one who brought up eBay. He has a, a, a prolific YouTube channel. And these are all things that he was aware of. He didn't necessarily have the nuts to bolts know-how on how to do those things. And that's kind of where I came in. We would have these conversations and I would look into all of these different solutions. So it was really a matter of him having that 10,000 foot view. And then me kind of being the, the one who likes to find solutions to problems, seeing what are our different options? How can we approach this? Uh, how can we basically solve this dilemma and then figuring out reverse engineering the steps to to get to that solution so my dad i mean credit to him he he's aware of everything that goes on <laughs> i mean he, he was he was doing online banking for you know decades back when it was brand new in the 90s and so i've learned so much from him over the years and you know he taught me uh, you know really critical skills like how to invest, how to manage, you know, your finances, things you don't necessarily learn in your early years in school. And so for me to be able to now give back to him and help him has been such a joy because I'm not a subject matter expert. I don't really know about clothes. So I can't really help him on that front. But in terms of helping bring his business into the 21st century, it's been really satisfying. It's been it's been one of the most fulfilling things I've ever done. Oh, I love that. And I love, John, that you've written this book because I think now you're going to help a lot of people 
get to, you know, not every dad has a son like you. Let's agree with that. And so, John, your new book, The Poshmark Guide for Individuals and Small Businesses. I, and by the way, I see, um, I see uh, Vicki Garvey joining us. I see Suzanne Brown actually on LinkedIn Live with us as well. So I, 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 we have so many friends here with us today. Kathleen as well on LinkedIn Live. Thank you so much uh, for being here. One question, I guess we got to make sure we answer too. Is, uh, Kathleen is asking, what is the closet name so that Kathleen can follow your dad's store here? And then we got to talk about this. Yeah, absolutely. It's actually uh, one of his... Uh, brands that he started years ago. It's called, it's uh, at to her, to him with the number two. Okay. Wonderful. And we'll definitely share that out later on in, in comments as well, but let's talk about the book. Okay. So, you know, how, how did, how did you discover Poshmark being such a great platform for business? And of course, you know, a lot of people discover different platforms and, you know, obviously you're great at these Poshmark parties and handling social. We know you're a beast on Twitter, so we know how good you are on social media. But why did you decide then to write this book? Oh, that's a great question. So back in 2019, once we started getting traction on Poshmark, we'd been on for about maybe six to eight months. Uh, in, starting in 2019, I actually shifted the podcast so I was doing a lot of interviews, as we talked about at the top of the show. Uh, and in 2019, I wanted to try something different with the format of the podcast. I wanted to share more of a journal of what I was working on. So I actually, in 2019, I did different collections of episodes, more kind of the almost mini courses on how to do different things. Because people have asked me over the years, how do you podcast? So I did a whole mini series on how to create a podcast. But the first mini series I started out with was a, a three to four month series on building a business on Poshmark. And what was cool was we had already been on there for almost a year, not quite a year. So I could document real time some of the things that we were working on, both you know opportunities, challenges, as we were building that business. And what ended up happening, Winnie, was that those episodes ended up being some of the most listened to on the podcast. They're still to this day, I've got uh, new listeners coming in on some of those older episodes. And what ended up happening was during the pandemic in, in 2020, I decided, you know what? I think uh, I've gotten enough signals from my podcast that it might be a good idea to put this into a book. Because, you know, as you know, Winnie, everyone has a different learning style. Some people learn very well from video, some from audio, and some people, you know, love to have it all in a book. And I have a collection of episodes and blogs, but I wanted to really put it together into a, a really concentrated step A through Z, step-by-step -step guide, both for individuals, so anyone who wants to start that side hustle, but also for small businesses, because really there wasn't anything out there. And I still think that that is a, a big market. You know, how do small businesses go online? And in fact, one of the, the reasons why I thought I, this book was important was because in early 2020, I was listening to an NPR story and they were documenting small businesses that were really having a lot, a lot of trouble shifting to a pandemic model. And one of the stories was a was a small boutique, I think, in somewhere in the Midwest that really was having a lot of trouble figuring out how to shift their model away from in-person to e-commerce. Because it's one thing for a big company to do that. So a big box store can do that very easily. For a small business, it's a lot harder to do. It's really tough to, to figure out how to do e-commerce, how to do it effectively, how to do it on a smaller budget and how to do it when you don't have a large social media following. So I really wanted to write this guide so that it would be aimed both at individuals, but also at small businesses who really are still struggling to figure out that e-commerce piece. I love that because you're right. I think it can be very intimidating, especially when this is your side hustle or, or maybe, you know, or, or even if you've been displaced in your, your transition phase of going from a typical nine to five to setting up your own e-commerce store and selling things and figuring out those, 
those those different bricks, right, to pile them on. I think this is what's really great. I, I got to share this book. So this is John's book. If you haven't seen this already, we're definitely sharing this with you. And of course, we've also shared John's podcast link with all of you as well. I see that uh, Vicki Garvey actually requested it on Facebook Live. So we're going to do that. But one chapter I got to put on everyone's radar. I think this is probably, there's a lot of golden nuggets in this, but this in particular, you're going to want to put a post-it in it like I did here. Um, this is actually page 132, and you're going to love the title. Okay, Sadiq, you're going to love this. Okay, 17 screw-ups, complaints, returns, and one-star reviews. This is, I think, John, something that a lot of people are concerned about. They're like, I don't want to sell on Poshmark. I don't want to sell on eBay because people could downgrade me. What if they don't even pay for my item? And like, you know, I just have a complete crash and burn experience. I don't know. It just seems too overwhelming. And therefore, I'll just keep my junk in the closet. What do you say to that? Yeah. And in fact, it, chapter 17, uh, when I wrote the first draft, my editor said, this is my favorite chapter or one of my favorite chapters. In fact, she encouraged me to double down and add even more content. So when I wrote this book, and as I talked about on, on the podcast, I don't want to give a lopsided picture. You know, it's easy to talk about success stories. It's easy to talk about, you know, make it sound so easy and glamorous. It's not. And, and that's one of the things that I really communicate throughout the book is that any endeavor, whether you're selling in store and retail or selling online, it takes a lot of work. You have to put in that time and that effort. And there are many different advantages to having an online business as opposed to an in-person business. But one of the things that I really wanted to do was really be transparent and talk about what are the challenges of maintaining and growing an online business, especially one that's an extension of a, an established business. And that's something that I've heard from people is that, well, I'm worried about, you know, what if I get, you know, negative reviews or what if, what if there's a problem? So I wanted to make sure that I, I covered some of those. And so I, I basically just, you know, put in as many stories as I can, uh, I could about what happens if you get a one-star review? What if you make a mistake? And, and I'll share one story. <laughs> we, it's, this one is one of the most interesting ones is, is that we, we during a, a really hectic period, we actually got two orders back to back and they were of very similar dresses. They were, they were both blue dresses around the same price, but different styles. And because of, uh, you know, the emails are coming in and because of these, th you know, threaded chains, which are kind of like the bane of my existence, <laughs> we, we had like two, uh, two different orders coming in and they looked so identical. What ended up happening was that the wrong label ended up on, on one of the, the shipments. And so Ouch. how did we, how did we resolve that? And I actually tell that story, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm not going to give away the story. It's in the book, <laughs> but it ended up being actually one of our finest hours because really it was about communicating with the customer, communicating with Poshmark, and it ended up working out. And, and so I talk about those things. I talk about the you know, what to do if there is a problem, if someone, you know, feels like that the item, you know, isn't as it was described, how do you resolve disputes? There's a whole dispute resolution process that Poshmark has that I, I really want to walk the individual or especially the small business on how to navigate that and why, if you do get a one-star review, and I say this, and this may be a controversial statement that if you do end up doing very well on any e-commerce platform, mm -hmm. if you generate a lot of sales, I think it's an inev inevitability that you're going to get at least one, if not a couple of one-star reviews. It's impossible to uh, have complete 100% five-star reviews. If you are a growing business, I think that's one of the one of the things that you will end up facing. So I, I always say it's a it's a when, not an if question. But I talk about that. I, I in fact, I even disclose in the book how many five, four, three, two, and one-star reviews we have, and why it hasn't impacted our business because my bottom line has always been as long as you're putting your best foot forward, doing the best that you can, treating each sale as if it were a four figure sale, the law of averages is going to work out in your favor. So, you know, that's why, and I, I say this at both the top of the chapter and at the bottom of the chapter, I do not share these stories to scare you off, but to give you that balanced perspective and to understand that this is just 
a part of you know being a business owner or running a side hustle is that sometimes you will run into issues but you know fortunately they're far and few in between if if you put your time and effort and you're conscientious about it these are not everyday occurrences, but they do happen. And it's important to have the right perspective on how to handle those issues when they arise. So John, I got to ask you this. I mean, we're friends, so I, I feel like I can ask you this. So um, I know you're handling these social media parties on Poshmark for, for the store and whatnot. Are you that enthused and excited about talking about dresses and clothing and to, to a point where, you know, you, how long do you think you can keep this up? Well, I'll tell you what, you know, I, it's definitely not my wheelhouse, but I will tell you one of the most fascinating things that I ever saw, and this was about year two into the business. We started out by selling mostly prom dresses and um, uh, bridesmaids dresses. When my dad, and my dad really is the forward thinker here, he was the one who said, we should start listing wedding gowns. And I said, are you kidding me? No one is going to buy a wedding gown online you know, when they haven't had a chance to try that on that, that I was not a believer in that, mm -hmm. but we started listing wedding gowns and I kid you not, Winnie, we've sold, I, I think close to a dozen wedding gowns wow. and getting the comments and the feedback from a customer who is just like, so thrilled about something that's a, such a huge part of their special day that's really been gratifying for me just to see that and, and to experience that. Or, you know, we've had, um, you know, a, a couple of customers. I, I remember there was a, a mother uh, of a special needs child who was attending her prom and she fell in love with the dress and we sold her the dress and she was just so thrilled with that. Just to hear those types of stories uh, to me, that's just been incredibly gratifying and ju just something I never would have expected. For me, uh, as you mentioned, I mean, how excited do I get about dresses and, and things like that? <laughs> Not very, but once in a while, when I hear stories like that, or when we get feedback like that, it is incredibly gratifying just to know that we've been able to do something like this. So I, I'm just really just kind of taken aback by that and just really glad that we took this step that we put in all that time to not only expand his business but to to be able to be a small small part of someone's special occasion it's it's pretty remarkable that is remarkable and so i gotta ask you this i think i think those of us watching you john we're kind of getting more excited about possibly selling some things in our closet and maybe other things on poshmark now so for those who are watching and like okay john i'm convinced i'm getting the book you gotta tell me though, some of the best tips when getting started on Poshmark, what would they be in your opinion? Oh yeah, I, I'm gonna share a couple. And one of the cool things was not only, uh, you know, putting in my experience, but I also, uh, you know, consult, I had three incredible beta readers who were also experienced Poshmark sellers. And I also actually uh, spoke with a number of people who work with the Poshmark organization. So I would say number one is, really establish a brand. And that starts with picking a, a username that either reflects your company or if you're an individual that reflects you. So it could be something like, you know, level up, something that reflects your personal or business brand. I think it's important to remember that Poshmark is very visual because a customer doesn't have an opportunity to come into your physical location and try on the item. You really want to be as robust with the photos as possible. So I recommend if you're doing this from your home, pick a corner. It doesn't have to be a fancy studio. Just pick a good corner with good lighting. In fact, uh, we were talking about lighting before we started this live stream, mm -hmm. but pick a dedicated space. And I do recommend when it comes to clothes, because they're very three-dimensional, don't use hangers. Either have a friend or yourself be the, the model or invest a few dollars in a mannequin so you can show the full 360 contours. And one feature that uh, I'm a big proponent of, which was added a year ago, is that Poshmark now allows you to shoot 15 second videos. Videos, I think, are a game changer. So you can do videos of your listings and that will make you stand out. But the number one tip that I have to be a, a successful on this platform is to be responsive. When you get a question, respond to those questions. Even if you can't right away 
make sure you do so by the end of the day or as soon as you can. Because, you know, some of you may be balancing uh, your, your day job or other things. Just be responsive. Even if you get the same question over and over, treat that question as if it's the most important one you're answering. And when you get those orders, I think the easiest way to stand out is to get those shipments out as soon as possible, either same day or very next day, because people do appreciate that. People are, are now accustomed to getting their items when they order as soon as possible. So the, the quicker you can get something out, the, the better you're going to do and, and the more positive feedback you're going to get from your customers. That's amazing. So it's kind of like the basics. You focus on the basics, Absolutely. but the basics are the most important things so that people feel like they're getting that Amazon fact or things are going out quickly or responsive. And I love that it's having that mindset of, you know, you're there to solve their problem. And you said that from the beginning, John, of how that I think is one of your biggest strengths, right? You're great at problem solving and just talking to people and making sure that they're happy. I love this. This is great. Um, all right, John. Well, you know, we've had so much fun, but I think now is time for a little speed round. Are you ready? I am. Speed round. Well, we've had some incredible questions and comments come in live with us, John, as we've been here today. I think Vicky's, uh, I think everyone's really excited about speed round, but certainly Vicky is saying, that's awesome. So many golden nuggets. Absolutely. John is always so generous with his information. So a great person. If you don't follow him already, I highly recommend you following him on all the social media platforms. He's really active on Twitter with us, especially on Wednesdays. But John, here we're going to do, we're going to give you basically two questions, about five minutes to answer them. So if you don't mind, we're going to start with the first one, John. You know, I know we've talked a lot today, but what would you say is your biggest aha moment in your adult life? What do you think this has been? Well, I mean, I was thinking that so many things come to mind with that. I've had a lot of aha moments throughout my life and my career, but one in particular, uh, you know, my mom, uh, who I would be remiss if I didn't mention her, she was just this, this really inspiring individual. She was a great entrepreneur herself, really immersed in the fashion industry. Uh, w when she passed away, you know, that was probably one of the most difficult times in my life. And it was through the grieving process that I really became closer with my dad and really understood what it is he does and how, how much he really worked all his life, you know, providing for, for his family, for us. And so, I think, you know, through that grieving process, you know, I was living on the West Coast at the time. I ended up moving uh, back to the East Coast to be closer to him. And, and you know, while it was a difficult time, it, it definitely brought us closer. So I, I would say that was probably my big aha moment. And, you know, she always inspired me in life to to just, you know, keep on trying and do your best and 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 find joy and happiness in whatever you do. And and I, I try to I try to take that to heart with everything that I do. I love that. I think we need that. We need to hear that today, John. More joy and happiness in everything that we do, and really prioritizing the people in your life, right? That that give yeah. you that joy and happiness. So 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 beautiful. Thank you so much, John. And I got to add, you know, Suzanne Brown is with us say on LinkedIn Live. Hi, Suzanne. Saying, they asked, we love Suzanne, and she's saying that you always share great nuggets on your social media channels. I couldn't agree with her more. I mean, I feel like not only do you share great content, John, but you're always so generous and, and teaching us the things that you've learned along the way, you know, oh, thank and, you. And packaging them in a way that makes sense for us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so thank you so much for that. All right. So the next question is this, you know, we believe on this show that everyone has their own yes factor. Some people call it a superpower. We call it yes factor. What would you say, John, that yours is? Ah, my yes factor actually comes in three parts. So there's curiosity, uh, you, you know, when my dad or, or someone that I'm working with comes to me with a problem, I become curious about it. That's where I learn more about what it is they do, why they do what they do. And then secondly, there's a, um, so these are the two parts that are kind of tied together. I, I'm, I'm very much of a problem solver mind. So I will try to figure out a solution if there's there's an issue if there's a way through and 
added to that, there's a stubbornness in, in not giving up, as I mentioned. And, and I, I, it, it's one thing for me to say it in, in five seconds or 10 seconds, but I go into this in the book, just how difficult it was to, to, really find an e-commerce solution. And so, and there are many times where I felt like, you know what, maybe we should give up. Maybe this is just not going to work. Maybe this is a pipe dream. So it's that combination of, of just trying to find a solution, but also that stubbornness of not giving up and just seeing something through to completion. And I, I think that's kind of a through line in a, lot, in a lot of things that I do, including writing, you know, writing a book it can have its own challenges. And there are times where I felt like, am, am I ever going to be able to kind of collate all this and see it through to the end? So it's that that combination, curiosity, uh, you know, that drive to finish something that I start and stubbornness that kind of continue, keeps me going along the way. I think it's also your humility, John. You're such a humble, sweet person, and I love that. So curious, problem solving, and stubborn. We'll take it. Even someone of your caliber, your talent. By the way, we didn't even mention that he went to a little school called Johns Hopkins. I mean, like, you know, talk about really just a full package, but not only that is not even with all your successes. I think the thing that Suzanne will probably agree with me on this is the thing that we all love about you, John, is just like you just you're just such a great human being. You've got kindness in to like in every every little bit of your soul so we are so grateful to be able to shine a light on you i know this is something usually you're on the other side of the microphone so we're grateful to be able to help tell your story what an honor to to have spent some time with you and i miss you i know before the pandemic we had some we were able to catch up and and um and meet in person that was really fun so hopefully we'll be able to do that again very soon but thank you so much for your time john if people want to follow you learn more about you and most importantly where can they go to get the book. Uh, thank you so much. First of all, thank you so much for having me on and and for this conversation. I really appreciate it. I always appreciate you, Winnie. You're you're absolutely amazing. So, uh, most social media you can find me at Be Moving Forward. The book is the Poshmark Guide for Individuals and Small Businesses. I should also mention I created a separate seller journal, which I think is a great tool for new sellers. You know, those of you just starting out, I have uh, inventory worksheets, negotiating guidelines. And you can find these books on Amazon. In, in fact, I th uh, right now, you know, they're very easy to find on Amazon. I have links on my website, bemovingforward.com. If you listen to my podcast, they're, they're in the show notes. So it's everywhere. You can find it very quickly, very easily. I love it. I love it. And where, where should people go? And do you, do you check your direct messages yourself? Like if people want to ask you questions, where would they go? You know what? Social media is pretty good. LinkedIn and Twitter. Uh, DMs, I, I'm not always great checking those every day, but I do get around to them. But, you know, I've had people tweet at me uh, directly about Poshmark. In fact, one of my beta readers who's since become one of my friends actually reached out to me on Twitter, which was pretty remarkable. She listened to the, she found the podcast and then reached out to me on Twitter. So Twitter, LinkedIn, those are generally good places to find me and, and you know, hit me up with questions. Amazing. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, John, for your time. And of course, thank you so much, my friends, for being here with us on this Friday afternoon or evening or morning, whatever your time zone is. We appreciate you being here. I hope that everybody has an incredible weekend. Of course, do me a favor. Take a moment to share this show. We want to get the message out about John and, of course, his incredible books that he has now. And as a reminder, you can find full episodes of Level Up with Winnie Sun on NASDAQ. Amazon Fire, Roku, and many other places. And don't forget to check out the Yes Factor with Winnie Sun on Apple Podcasts or wherever you tune in to listen. With that, take a moment to like our stream. And of course, I will see you next week. But please have a, a beautiful weekend and we appreciate you so much. Take care now. Bye-bye.